traffic stops are their most dangerous duty. Absolutely. That's called a threatening gesture. Hello and welcome to Best Case, Worst Case. This is your host, Jim Clemente, former New York City prosecutor, retired FBI profiler, and writer-producer on CBS's Criminal Minds. And with me today is my co-host. Hi, everybody. It's Francie Hakes. I'm a former state and federal prosecutor. And the federal part is going to come into play today, Jim. Really? Yep. Okay. Well, not too many spoilers, please. So this is going to be one of those great episodes where I get to interview Francie to talk about one of her best cases. And what kind of case is it, Francie? Well, Jim, it's a fairly basic case. It was a convicted felon in possession of a firearm case. Hmm. So I take it that convicted felons are not allowed to possess a firearm. That is correct. According to the code, 18 United States Code, section 922G, I think I remember correctly, they are prohibited from possessing guns. Well, and that you bring up a very important thing, and that is 18 USC. So 18 USC is the section of the criminal code, the federal criminal code, that most crimes fall under, right? There's some other things like in the 20s or 25s or something, mostly some weird 18, things. Yeah. yeah, mostly 18. So 18 USC is a very common thing whenever you're spouting out about federal criminal laws. That's right. So it's a violation of 18 USC what? I believe 922G if memory serves. 922G. At least it's not very specific of a memory. <laughs> Good Lord. <sighs> what did you do in your misspent youth? Right? Memorize the US code. No, mostly. Great. Okay. So it's a unlawful possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. That's right. And where were you? What were you doing when you got this case? Well, this case was really interesting because it came into me when I was a federal prosecutor and assistant U.S. attorney in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I had been a state prosecutor for six years and tried a lot of cases. And when I came into the U.S. attorney's office, I had to almost start all over again. You had to go through a training program, mm -hmm. which I just really did not appreciate. Well, Francie, I just <laughs> have to tell you, because, you know, you're always trying to say that you were my boss when I was in the FBI. But you were an assistant United States attorney, whereas I was a supervisory special agent. Just trying to figure out which one of those would outrank the other. But anyway, oh, go on. Jim, Don't let Jim, me Jim, sidetrack. Jim, just so sidetracked. He always wants to sidetrack. So this case in particular came to me early in my career as a federal prosecutor mm -hmm. and was kind of unusual. I specialized in technology facilitated crimes against really? children as my career went on. But at the beginning, I was in what's called the training section mm -hmm. of the office for almost a year. So you kind of go around to different divisions and try different cases and so forth. So you get a feel for all the different types of violations. That's exactly right. The only type of thing I never worked was white collar. I think it was fairly clear to everyone that if you showed me a banker's box, it's the one thing in life pretty much from which I will run screaming in fear. Interesting because... I'll have to talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's just not my thing. But so I'm kind of in the training section still, and I've only been in the U.S. Attorney's Office for, I don't know, at this point, maybe around a year. And I'm starting to get ready to transition into crimes against children and other violent crimes. Mm, okay. And so I was contacted by one of my favorite ATF agents, an agent named Michael Rowland. That's alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. And now, Roland was a former Secret Service agent. So he was super squared away and really serious and very dedicated. Mm. And so he came to my office one day and he said that he had a felon in possession case that had been worked by, very unusually, the Georgia State Patrol. Okay. And why did the Georgia State Patrol have this case? So I think every state pretty much has state troopers and they are almost always uh, up and down highways. They definitely do drug cases, but any other kind of case is a little bit outside their normal casework. So this one was unusual. And Michael Rowland said that he thought that the case was so outstanding and such a great um, prosecution for us and that the person who was being prosecuted for it, who'd been charged, was so bad and what he had done to the state patrol was so egregious that he thought it was worth federal prosecution versus state prosecution. Oh, really? Well, what would the difference be in terms of the outcome if you get convicted on the state level for possession of a firearm when you're a felon or on the federal level? Well, in Fulton County, which is city of Atlanta, where this happened, he would have gotten a slap on the wrist. Now, with his record, he might have gotten 18 months, maybe two oh. years. But on the federal level, he was looking at a maximum possible penalty of 10 years. Okay, so that's pretty significant. It is a significant difference, for and sure. Ju just so people know, actually, he could be tried for both crimes. Because if you're committing a state or local crime at the same time that you're committing a federal crime, you could be prosecuted for the state or local crime and then prosecutor for the federal crime or vice versa. It's not double jeopardy because the federal statutes, 18 USC, blah, 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 
are different statutes that were violated. That's right. And state and federal government are what's called separate sovereigns. And so it doesn't violate double jeopardy. Although there are some paperwork things you have to run through. I had a couple of cases in my career where someone was prosecuted at the state level and we just felt like whatever the sentencing was, was insufficient for justice. And if you could get your bosses at the Department of Justice to agree with you that it was insufficient, then we might be able to take a case. It was called a pettit waiver. Uh, it was very rare, but it certainly happened. But in this case, he had not yet been prosecuted on any level. Now, you just used the term, a pettit waiver. Is that like a petty waiver? <laughs> Do you say, is it P-E-T-I-T, but it's like a petty larceny? Yes. And in fact, I took a, some French, so it would be a petite waiver, but that's not I'm how sure. we pronounce it in the South. <laughs> I know. Well, we pronounce it as petty. Yes, we call it pettit. It's good old pettit waiver in Atlanta. Okay, just want to make sure. And what exactly is a pettit waiver? A pettit waiver just means that the federal government is going to waive what they would normally do, which was defer to the state sovereign in that it had already prosecuted. So we're waiving that normal deference and going ahead and stepping in and prosecuting again. Got it. So you got this case. This ATF agent tells you it's a great case. What do you do next? So Michael Rowland brings me the case, and I review the case file, and I try to figure out what happened. It isn't an overly complicated case, but the facts are fascinating to me. Really? And so much so that I was really excited about the case once I finished reviewing the state trooper's report and then the ATF's report, which went hand in hand. So tell us about the state trooper's report. So this was great. This was written by a state trooper named Jimmy Kilgallen. Hmm. Um... Italian fellow? <laughs> Hardly. Okay. As Probably Irish, Irish. Yes, as Irish background as Irish backgrounds come. And Jimmy Kilgallen had a very interesting background, which I can't really talk about, but he did other things before he joined the Georgia State Patrol. And so he was really um, squared away and very, um, let's just say, well-trained in the art of self-defense. Okay. You can't talk about his nope. history, though? Can't do it. Really? Nope, can't do it. But okay. We'll just but he's suffice. a very accomplished self-defender. Yes, defender. he's an accomplished self-defender. He's about six foot tall, broad-shouldered, very fit. Kind of like me. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. And just looks like, if you need protecting, he's your guy. Okay. So I read his report. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened. So one kind of rainy day in Atlanta... Jimmy Kilgallen, state trooper, is on patrol. Is this anything like that song, A Rainy Night in yeah, Georgia? not at all. Okay, just wondered. No, sorry. That's not the light. The night the lights went out in Georgia. Okay. No, this is not that. This, instead, is Trooper Kilgallen driving his Georgia State Patrol vehicle, which I have ridden in myself. Really? And um, For professional reasons. For professional not, reasons, of okay, course. I don't not, mean it was a joyride. Well, I just wondered if, you know, maybe he got pulled over and No, no, he took me to the scene. Oh, the scene of the crime. The scene of the crime. Okay. So here's what happened. On mm -hmm. a slightly rainy day in Georgia, Trooper Kilgallen is patrolling the streets of the city of Atlanta, Fulton really? County. And as he's driving down one particular street, he notices a guy on a motorcycle pull out of a driveway and start down the road. Okay. And he sees that this man is not wearing a motorcycle helmet. Okay. Well, in some states, it's not necessary to wear a motorcycle helmet. But I assume that in the state of Georgia, it is. That's right. It is illegal not to wear a motorcycle helmet in Georgia. Well, I just don't understand the whole thought of you can get on a motorcycle and you can not put a helmet on. And almost everybody I know who owns a motorcycle says that it's not whether you're going to fall, it's when you're going to fall. Well, Jim, that is very perceptive of you and may come into play in just a minute. Really? Well, and another thing is the reason why they call them donor cycles at the ER is that it's a very, very dangerous thing to ride a motorcycle even with a helmet. So it is foolish not to ride a helmet, especially in a state that says it's illegal to do so, and especially right in front of a Georgia State Trooper. That's right. In a fully marked car, by the way. Okay. So there he is in his fully marked car, and he sees this guy without a, without a helmet. Mm -hmm. And as he later testifies, he intends to pull him over and give him a warning. It's not really a big deal, but he's concerned because it's a safety violation. Mm -hmm. So he turns on his lights and siren. He has to make a U-turn to go back and follow the motorcycle. So mm -hmm. he makes a U-turn. Lights and sirens. Pulls him over. Okay. That sounds pretty vanilla at this point. That's right. So he walks up to the motorcycle, and he says, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you for a minute. You're not wearing a helmet could I see your driver's license? So one Reginald Molden hands him his driver's license. Nice. And as part of the standard procedure, Trooper Kilgallen goes back to his car to run the driver's license and run the license plate mm -hmm. just to make sure. Everything's cool. Everything's cool. Is it stolen? Is he where he's supposed to be? Well, as Trooper Kilgallen walks back to his car, Mr. Molden decides he doesn't want to wait. Really? So he peels out. Without his license. Without his license. Oof, not going to be very difficult them to figure out who he is. Well, you're assuming he uses the right address on his license. Or where he lives. Where well. he lives. So he pills out on his motorcycle. Trooper Kilgallen now runs back to his car, jumps in, turns his lights and sirens back on, and starts to pursue Mr. Molden. Okay. While he's pursuing him, he's trying to figure out who the guy is. Why is he fleeing? Are there warrants out for him? It's a reasonable assumption. That's yes. right. But none of that is the case. Hmm. 
So there doesn't appear to Trooper Kilgallen to be any obvious reasons why Mr. Molden would flee on a motorcycle. So now Jimmy thinks to himself, he's fleeing for a bad reason. What does he have on him, possibly, that he didn't want me to see? Got it. So he calls for backup. So he's racing down the streets. And the problem, by the way, listeners, when a motorcycle is being chased by an automobile, motorcycles can accelerate much faster, much quicker, maneuver, turn, everything. And most of the time, they can outrun even a souped up big time state trooper car. Well, and if he had outrun Jimmy Kilgallen, this would be a really short story. Yeah. I'm but kind of thinking maybe he didn't. No, right? he didn't. He didn't outrun him. Instead, He's joined in the chase, Jimmy Kilgallen is, by a couple of other state troopers, including in their own cars, including one named Russ Clark. Okay. So as they approach a particularly busy intersection, Jimmy is starting to worry about what is going to happen when Molden on his motorcycle speeding away from the cops is going to do. Mm. The pavement is damp. It's Atlanta. It's been a, re- a rainy day in Atlanta. And Molden, because of the traffic pattern or just something in his head, I don't know why, decides to try to make a hard left turn mm. in the middle of the intersection. Okay. So he makes this hard left turn, leaning his bike, and that does not work. Really? It goes out from under him? It goes out from under him, and he slams into the pavement. Okay. In what looks to Jimmy to be a pretty violent contact mm-hmm. with Mr. Molden's face and the wet Atlanta pavement. And remember, he doesn't have a helmet on. He does not have a helmet on. Not going to be pretty. It might not be pretty, but Mr. Molden does not lay there. He leaps up. And this is when Jimmy really starts to notice what he's wearing. And he's wearing what looks like those kind of coveralls, like like a mechanic would wear. It's it's a one-piece coverall with a zip right up the front. So Molden is off his bike, forcefully off his bike, and now he's on foot and he's fleeing. Okay, the fact that he didn't, I don't know, just get knocked out or he didn't just get hurt so bad that he couldn't get up could also indicate he might be on substances like unlawful substances. Yes. And that's a great point, Jim, because it's one of the things that most people I don't think really think about. Although today there certainly have been a lot of shootings of police, but police will tell you that statistically speaking, traffic stops are their most dangerous duty. Absolutely. Definitely. It's when more police get shot or killed doing a a normal everyday traffic stop. That's right. And now you have Jimmy Kilgallen and his two trooper buddies in a situation where They're in the middle of an intersection and an offender who, for reasons they don't understand, has fled police and is now fleeing on foot. So they have to make a decision. Right. So I really want to find out what they decide to do. Do they get out of their cars and chase them on foot or they stay in their cars or do they split the difference? So, Jim, as you remember, Jimmy and his trooper buddies, Russ Clark and and one more are faced with this decision. Are they coming out of their car and they're going to, are they going to chase Reginald Molden or are they going to let him go? Well, Jimmy Kilgallen is not letting him go. Okay. That is not in his nature. So his car obviously is the first one to the scene and he does what police call bails out of his car. He basically stops it, throws it in park and he's out of the car. He doesn't close the door. There's no mm-hmm. locking it. It's just, he's bailing he's out. Gone, right. He's gone because he's chasing what he thinks is a dangerous suspect. The grass is wet. It's been a rainy day. I don't know if our listeners have ever seen troopers shoes, but they're that shiny kind of very uncomfortable looking leather leather shoe. At least they were back then. And that's what Jimmy is wearing to try to chase this suspect through yards and around um, houses. And he doesn't have any idea why this guy is running. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, Trooper Russ Clark is the second to arrive in his car. He also bails out. One little known fact, Jim, this is truly behind police lines. Russ Clark was known in the unit as the gazelle. Oh, really? Yes. He got a college scholarship for track. Okay. Really fast. Got and it. he's long and lean and motivated. Got it. So the interesting thing that's going on in these guys' heads, what's happening is Jimmy is now aware that behind him comes the gazelle. Okay. And what he's actually worried about in one part of his brain while his police part of his brain is also working is thinking to himself, I have to catch this guy quickly or the gazelle is going to beat me to it. <laughs> a little competitive spirit that's there? That's exactly right. A little competitive spirit. So as they're running, Jimmy decides that he thinks he can get an angle on Molden. Molden's okay. running one way, so Jimmy kind of takes a little bit around so that he can come at an angle to Molden. So now he can see at least a little bit the front of Molden's body. Mm-hmm. And as Molden's running, he looks back at Jimmy and he sees how close he is. And Jimmy sees him unzip mm. his suit, that whatever that thing is, that, right, that the one mechanic piece. one right. piece. Well, in case you don't know, that's called a threatening gesture. If somebody has a coat, jacket, a jumpsuit with a zipper and they unzip it or open their jacket, 
Usually it's to get access to a weapon. Well, and this guy's not like he's galloping along. I mean, he's running as mm -hmm. fast as he can. So the gesture Jimmy thinks is a threatening gesture when he unzips, but he doesn't just unzip that jumpsuit. Jimmy can see his right hand reaching inside the jumpsuit. Okay. And now Jimmy has closed the distance and he is convinced that Molden is reaching for a gun. Okay. So he f just literally leaps. He just takes a flyer, trying to hope he can tackle him. He said they had just gone through a park with kids playing. Mm. This is a residential neighborhood. And now it looks to him like Molden's trying to pull a gun. So he takes a flying leap just ahead of Russ Clark, <laughs> the gazelle. The gazelle the doesn't gazelle. get the leap. He gets the leap. That's right. Okay. And he tackles him. He managed to tackle him. And they start to, as we would call in the South, tussle. They start to tussle. And he is really concerned. He can't. He doesn't know what Molden has in his waistband. He just knows he's been reaching for it. He continues to reach for it. And so... He strikes him. He strikes Molden with his fist to Molden's face to try to subdue him so that he can handcuff him and safely see what it is that's in his waistband. Right. And that's what happens. He strikes him, subdues him. By now, the gazelle is on top of them. Okay. And so together, they are able to get him handcuffed and pull down those oh, coveralls. Actually, now right. I've been saying jumpsuit. They're coveralls. He now pulls down the coveralls. And guess what is in Reginald Molden's waistband? Well, seeing as this was a firearm possession by a felon, I'm going for... A firearm. Good, good guess, Jim. Nobody could ever accuse you of being slow on the I uptake. Know, look at me. Although I do all the time. Anyway, yes, it was a gun. What and kind of gun? It was a loaded gun. Okay. That's serious. It was a loaded gun, and they now have him under arrest. Jimmy is considering having him charged with aggravated assault. All aggravated assault is means you have put someone by your actions in fear of receiving an immediate serious bodily injury. Right. And so many people think that under the law, assault means that you have actually punch somebody or fought with somebody. But in fact, that's called battery. And assault is the threat of a battery. So another behind the police lines piece of information. That's right. That's right. And that's based on old English law. That's that's a that's an ancient, ancient mm -hmm. proposition in the law. So Jimmy and the gazelle, Russ Clark, have Mr. Molden in custody. I called him the gazelle as many times as I could, by the way, in the trial of this case. <laughs> so they have him in custody. He's arrested. They call the ATF because they're trying to track the gun. Is it what's called a crime gun? That is, has it been used in a crime? That's when the ATF got involved and Special Agent Michael Rowland got involved. Got it. It was not a crime gun, but he was a convicted felon and so he was unlawfully in possession of so it. So when, when he first ran his license, or did he while he was driving after him, he didn't get a he chance He never had to? a chance. Okay. But he would, have, he would have come back as a convicted felon. Yes. And what kind of felony did he get convicted of? Violent felonies. Mm. In fact, he had a prior aggravated assault conviction. Really? Yes. Okay. So he was a violent guy for sure. And Jimmy and his colleagues were lucky that Molden could not, while running full tilt, manage to pull that firearm out of his waistband and shoot him. Mm -hmm. Because Jimmy has no doubt today that if he'd been able to get it out of his waistband, he would have shot him. Right. And they were very close. So it probably would have hit him. So they come to me. I'm reviewing the case. I'm happy about the case because I'm literally furious that someone has even considered shooting a police officer trying to do his job. And by the way, the police officer was just going to give him a warning for the helmet. Mm. But Molden knew he had an illegal gun on his waistband. Right. And it was that consciousness of guilt that caused him to flee. You sound like a prosecutor. <laughs> right? And one of the things I like to say in cases like this to a jury is a quote. I think it comes from the Bible. I can't really remember. And I must admit I'm not a scholar. But it goes something like this. The guilty man flees where no one pursues, while the righteous stands bold as the lion. Mm. Mr. Molden did not stand bold as the lion. He fled. Mm. He fled. Okay. And then he did get pursued. So now we're in court. He's pled not guilty. He can't take responsibility for what he's done because his sentence looks like it is probably going to end up being that maximum of 10 years. So he figures he has nothing to lose. Roll the dice, go to trial. Got it. And that's what we did. Guess who really went on trial during the trial of this case? What do you mean? Not... Jimmy Kilgallen. Really? Yes, because the defense attorney tried to uh, imply and outright told the jury that Jimmy had done something wrong, well, that this was a police brutality case. Because it. you see, Mr. Molden ended up with his cheekbone broken. His left cheekbone was broken. Now that is where Jimmy struck him, but it is also where well, he hit face. the pavement yes. with his face. Without a helmet. Without a helmet Which on a speeding motorcycle. Which was the thing that originally started this whole thing. Exactly right. But oh. Jimmy went on trial, as is classic, and the defense attorney outright accused Jimmy and Russ Clark of planting that gun. He called it their throw piece, as if they just drive around with a gun they can plant on people to frame them. Mm. A ridiculous claim. And were they able to, by any chance, get any DNA off that weapon to prove that it came from the bad guy and not the cops? No, there was no fingerprints and no DNA. Mm. And that's also a common misconception about guns, especially when it comes to fingerprints. Fingerprint experts have told me that you can touch a dry, smooth surface right this second, lift your fingers, and that's no guarantee the print artist, the, the print examiner, can take a print. 
Yeah, I know. But here's one of the problems. And I found this out when I was an FBI evidence response team member. The way people handle the gun between the time it's recovered and the time it's tested can do a lot to get rid of prints that are on there accidentally. People think that if just because they have rubber gloves on, for example, that they can handle a gun and it won't ruin prints that are on there. Actually, it'll smear the print, wipe them off. It's ridiculous. And so you really have to be extremely careful how you handle the gun when you recover it. And of course, safety first. So you can't really be thinking about prints when you're trying to get it away from somebody. But then how you transport it to the lab and how the fingerprints are attempted to be lifted and all that stuff can can mean that they don't actually get fingerprints. And for example, the, the butt of the gun, most of the handles of guns are etched so that they're not a smooth surface. So it's much more difficult to get prints off them anyway. However, if it's treated properly, you maximize your chances of getting prints off a weapon. Yeah, unfortunately, we got nothing. And part of that, of course, was because the troopers handled the gun when they pulled it out of his waistband. I mean, they're certainly not thinking about prints. They're thinking we're really near a playground where there's a bunch of kids playing and we cannot afford to take any chances that he can get this. So they pulled it off him and tossed it away. So no prints, no prints. But a great jury. Um, We did a good job in jury selection, I think, in picking a jury that was going to be fair. They did not for one minute believe the defense attorney's claims that this was police brutality coupled with the police planting a gun. They came back in relatively short order. If memory serves, this was about a 45-minute verdict. Let me just ask you something, though. Was there a video camera at the front of his car? There was. There was. We did have video from the trooper's car. However, once he pulled his, so we got to see Molden as he pulled him over. He has no helmet on. And we got to see him flee when Jimmy was just walking back with his license. So we saw all that. We saw the chase. What about the fall? We saw the fall. And so we in the, the fall, you could see that he went down on his left side? Clearly see him got smash it. his Perfect. left cheek. Got it. So all that came into evidence. But it didn't stop the defense attorney from claiming that his injuries were caused by Jimmy's fist. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Francie, are you telling me? That a defense attorney made up a false story, <laughs> a false narrative to try to protect his client? Yes, that is really? what I'm saying. I am shocked and offended. Shocked, shocked. It is very offensive. And offended. No, it's totally true. That's uh, what happened. Wow. So he makes it up and accuses this very upstanding trooper and his friends of planting a gun as if they just drive around with one for that purpose. It's a ridiculous claim. The jury didn't buy it. They came back in 45 minutes and they convicted him of being a felon in possession of a firearm. The great thing about that charge is, unlike in most cases, you can't tell a jury about someone's prior criminal history unless it is particularly relevant to the crime you're charging. And unless he had a prior felon in possession of a firearm, which I don't believe he did, we couldn't use it. Mm. So we normally couldn't have used his aggravated assault conviction. But But you have to prove to the jury that he is a convicted felon for that charge. So we were able to tell them about his criminal history. And isn't it also that the defense opened the door to his propensity for violence? And can't you prove it that way as well? Yes, we could have definitely done that way, but we didn't have to because it's part of the elements of that crime. That's the beauty of that particular charge. So the jury comes back, they've convicted him. We wait a couple of months for the sentencing, the pre-sentence report to come out and it's time for sentencing. Mm -hmm. And the judge sentenced him to the maximum penalty, 10 years. Well, I guess he kind of deserved it, huh? He did. And you know, I'm still uh, friends with Jimmy Kilgallen today. And I told him I was going to present this case on the podcast. He's currently working for NCIS. And I told him I was going to talk about this case on the podcast. And I asked him whether he had kept track of Molden. And he said he recently looked. And while he'd gotten out by now on that federal charge, because it was more than 10 years ago, he's back in jail on something else. Yeah, probably not an upstanding citizen. Definitely not. So I have to ask you, why is this a best case for you? This is definitely one of my best cases because I got the pleasure of working with the troopers at Georgia State Patrol, which I was the first federal prosecutor in my office to bring a case with the Georgia State Patrol. We did two more cases after that, similar cases of felons in possessions in possession of guns that the GBI, excuse me, the Georgia State Patrol found. But what really made it my best case, I think our listeners are going to giggle a little. And I think this is the episode that uh, we are releasing on Christmas Day. So a little bit of a light touch here at the end. When I was trying this case, I had literally a Georgia State Patrol trooper phalanx of about six troopers walking me from my office to the courtroom in their full dress, trooper hat, uniforms every single day of trial. (laughs) And every single prosecutor in the office was jealous because it looked like I had the boys in blue literally escorting me and bodyguarding me every day. And when they left, I felt sad because I was never going to have that again. But it's a best case because not only did I get a chance to get to know the work of the Georgia State Troopers. But I got to do more cases with them, and they were so appreciative that they thoughtfully gave me a plaque in the Uh, shape, it's a wooden plaque in the shape of the state of Georgia, thanking me for taking their case. Oh, that's so nice. It was great, and I really appreciate the opportunity as a federal prosecutor to have those experiences that uh, you didn't always get. That's great. Yeah, it sounds like an amazing case and something that was able to get, effectively get somebody who's a violent felon off the street for at least 10 years, and that's a wonderful thing. It was a win. 
Great. Thank you for listening to Best Case, Worst Case. And Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas and, and Happy, happy holidays. holidays. Until next time. Best Case, Worst Case is an XG production. Produced by Jim Clemente at Empire Studios LA. Engineered and edited by Mike Thal. Music composed and performed by Simba Tsumba. And hosted by Wondery. You can listen to Best Case, Worst Case on your favorite listening app. We are on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to do something about child sexual abuse, Darkness Delight can help. Did you know that more than 90% of the time children are sexually abused by someone they know? Jim, this isn't about stranger danger. It's about learning the true risks. Darkness to Light's training can help prevent, recognize, and react to child sexual abuse in your community. When you make the decision to get involved, kids can be protected. It starts with you. Visit www.d2l.org to take the training and learn more. That's d2l.org.